but we <laughs> you know. Huh? It also, you yeah, I just went for myself. <laughs> when I was uh, flying back from Hawaii and getting to uh, uh, buy, so we wanted to buy a refrigerator for our house in Carmel. And uh, they knew where I had just been. And the fact that whoever had this credit card was in Hawaii wanted to make a purchase for California. They said, your card's not valid. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's just, Gave them the appearance of the card and then stole it. Somebody ran the purchase all over. Well, on both of them, I have these setting the email. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
things too, because if you use the mail order system, there you go. That's what I do. Okay, and they do that because well, I did so much math. Oh yeah, absolutely. I figured that one. Yeah. It didn't take too long. It was pretty yeah. obvious in the mail. Yeah, and it's getting more gray. You know, you get more bald. Yeah. Your hair is getting brown and brown. You're a general. Some lady said that. Every once in a while, I have to put a little yeah. color in my hair. I do it about once every five months. The good news is, though, that everybody calls me sir. You know, I've noticed that. At some point, you just accept that. That's the way it's going to be. I was just going to check. Sydney, no. Yeah, what I could typically do is take things like that. Touchdown. I, actually, the truth of the matter is, I was doing it on my cell phone. And I, I was in a car, but I was paying attention to the game. And then I saw they scored with about 40, Notre Dame scored with about 40 seconds left. And I thought, oh, it's over. So I just stopped listening. And then I see the paper the next day. Yeah. Can you move to this Oh, it's still. Is that your wife? <laughs> You know, now that the storm came out, all the time, you know, you're coming on every weekend. It's like either or. It would be, I gotta go to Colorado. All right, a lot of laws. I still know his last play. He's not going. He's not going. All right, they just put him in. The Bell emergency. And they had to put him in a retirement home, and he doesn't like that at all. So we were going down. Yeah, no, he was just kind of on his Yeah. Although, you know what, the only thing about it, he needs somebody. He sits in his chair all day. It's uh, in North Kirkland, yeah. but it's close to, to me. Yeah. Drew, yeah. Drew only lives about uh, a mile from there at most. Yeah. 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 
journals today, we've got uh, a lot to cover. <laughs> so, um, I actually am going to start with a very quick one here that's got nothing to do directly with allergy, but something that's a tremendous part of all of our lives in the last couple of years, mostly to be controversial and start a little bit of discussion. So this was an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, as you can see, and the title frankly says it all, I think, in, uh, in the lives that we've been living since this transition to electronic medicine. Transitional chaos or enduring harm, the electronic health record and the disruption of medicine. And that title caught my attention. I sent it around to everybody in our practice group and everybody terms of uh, what you see here on the screen, what our lives have become. So, just a basic review of what this uh, editorial said, that we're about 10 years and $30 billion in a government stimulus into the mandate that we transition to electronic health records. Interesting, they point out early on that um, they realize that that they had to give an incentive that people were not, not going to make this transition just if it was a mandate that it was so expensive to do this that the government had to give a significant stimulus to provoke us to do it. Um, this is the name of the government act, I never knew this, um, that, that got us to this point. And this is just a, a restatement of the amount. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I could sort of tolerate this system until we got to so-called meaningful use, which I call meaningless use. <laughs> I mean, generating, I don't know what's done, uh, maybe we'll have a little discussion here um, in, in other systems, but in our system, this document for meaningful use that we're supposed to hand out to patients uh, is usually a useless document and uh, more complex than it needs to be, and I'm not sure we really help our patients with it. Um, this editorial review uh, relied heavily on a book by this author if you want to really get into the transition to electronic health records. Uh, that's the name of his book, The Digital Dr. Hope Hype and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age. There's some interesting vignettes in this editorial here. Uh, there's one doctor who can tell one day's notes from the others because people copy and paste and just repeat note day by day. This guy prints out notes from one day to the next, holds them up to the light, so he can physically see the words that have changed from one day to the next. <laughs> or something that a number of us, myself included, say, cardiology says it could be worse, I could be younger. I don't welcome this for you young people in medicine, the way that this is going. And then more pragmatic things, small practices that have been bankrupt by this transition to electronic medical records. <coughs> Uh, hours that are consumed by all of us in onerous data entry unrelated to patient care. That's what really drives me crazy about this. I'm not sure exactly what we're accomplishing by it. Um, massive intrusions on our relationship with patients as we spend time just typing away on computer screens as opposed to looking patients in the eye and, and uh, doing the job we're supposed to be doing. And 
just lastly, one of the big issues so far still is lack of intraoperability. So when I attend at the university and I'm in the EPIC system, which I find even more difficult than the centricity we use in our office, these systems don't talk to one another and the companies that make these systems don't particularly have a commercial interest in making them talk to one another. Um, this is, I think, one of the key things here. Electronic medical records are not designed really to increase workflow or communication. They're really for billing and for the government to be able to collect data um, on, on health care um, and make decisions. Another interesting point they make here is it's not user-centered design. In other words, physicians generally are not asked to help design electronic health records. And they give an interesting contrast how Boeing designs airplanes. They ask pilots to help them design new airplanes because both the pilots are going to fly the airplanes and they're the people who should make decisions about it. No one has particularly asked us how to design electronic health records to make them more user friendly. And then this is sort of a closing comment that the notes that we create uh, have been rendered uselessly homogeneous by the tyranny of clicks and auto-populated fields. The way I, I feel, I mean, I, when I write a note, fortunately, I use the dragon dictation and at least speak the words I want to speak as opposed to having a computer generate sentences that look like a computer generated sentence. So anyway, I thought this was um, very interesting. We have got different healthcare systems uh, here. I don't know if other people want to comment on how things are going in, in their EHR or for those of us at least one person I know in the room who has not transitioned to this as of yet, who's probably very happy that he has it. Well, I don't know. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> I, I saw a note yesterday from uh, Rich Gower, our colleague in Spokane, who's retiring or at least leaving his practice, I think, to go and work with industry. And he sent notes over with one of his uh, HAE patients. So all of his HAE patients are going to probably transition to either the University or those of us in practice, and he's still writing handwritten notes because I couldn't read any of them, but I've got <laughs> like 50 pages of handwritten notes. But I have to admit that at least uh, type notes, if you can read the words, if you at least edit what you were typing, is more useful than handwritten notes. So, anyway, just a commentary um, if anybody wants to comment about their experience with electronic records. Otherwise, we'll move to, uh, to Drew as the next speaker. By the way, the word of the day is uh, Seattle, if you wouldn't get that. So, I don't know if any of you guys go to what's new in allergy and immunology and up to date. Um, they update about every three to six months, and I think it's great. They kind of briefly outline the pertinent studies that have come out over the past six months or so. So I, I'll peruse that every few months, and uh, I found these two articles, which I thought were really interesting for different reasons. The first one's about cross-reaction between estreonam, carbapenems, and the penicillins. As we're finding more and more, there's less cross-reactivity than we originally thought, but the the big study are, are studies are lacking in a lot of these cases, and this is one of the biggest ones to come out, so I thought we'd review that. But as I'll talk about, it's not a perfect study. We'll go over the reasons why I think it's not. And then another interesting one, I'm getting these patients coming in saying, you know, my atopic dermatitis, and I mainly see adults, and they're telling me it's worsening during the grass and, and tree season, and I thought, yeah, there's a theoretical, you know, mechanism behind that, but I don't have a lot of great data to to say that is or isn't the case, depending on their skin prick testing results. But uh, this is one of the better studies that have come out recently reviewing this topic, and in a small, but uh, I think a very well done study. So the first one, again, this comes up a lot in our practice. We get a ton of drug allergy calls, and a lot of them have to do with this issue of a patient with penicillin allergy. You know, sounds like anaphylaxis, what do I do with estreonam? Less so estreonam, but carbapenems come up a lot. And what I often do find is uh, patients with a history of um, reaction to septaz often will be get, get put on astreonam. And that's actually not a great idea because they have the same side chain. So there's theoretically a, a bigger risk for a reaction than, say, moving on to a different cephalosporin or 
or a penicillin agent. And they outlined that only three studies on more than 10 subjects with documented IgE mediated hypersensitivity. And I'm going to go over why I don't think all of these patients in the study have documented IgE mediated hypersensitivity. But um, only, uh, only a few small studies have documented the cross reactivity with us, tree and M. And the reason they brought this up is when this, uh, there's a study from the 80s, I believe, that looked at penicillin positive skin prick patients and uh, tested to us trianam by skin prick, and the reactivity rate was almost 50%. Obviously, we know that's not the case, but original data was saying that us trianam may have some cross-reactivity with these penicillin agents. So, what they did is took a, a, a big cohort of patients with what they thought were IgE-mediated allergy to penicillins. They performed skin prick testing to us trianam and the carbapenems in these patients, and actually performed a, a challenge. It's, it's a huge study, and, and it must have taken a ton of time, I think it was done over the course of about 10 years, at a facility um, in Italy where evidently they see a ton of drug allergy. So they reviewed 290 subjects and skin tested them to a bunch of different penicillin agents, and I'll go over that on my next slide. But uh, 212 of these patients had skin prick tests that were positive. That seems incredibly high, even though this is, there are high acuity in these patients, but we'll go over that data. And they also took you know, some controls, 30 um, patients without penicillin allergy, and tested them with as trianam and erdapenem, given they didn't know which was a non-irritating dose in either of these two medications, and found what was a non-irritating dose in normal <coughs> individuals. So, skin prick testing, and, and i got to admit, this is more extensive than what we do. We usually just do prepen and penicillin G. They did prepen, the minor determinants. They also did amoxicillin at 1 and then 20 milligrams per milliliter. That's higher than the dose we use. I think we use two milligrams per milliliters our uh, our uh, ampicillin or amoxicillin skin test. Same with piperacillin or zosin. If they had a positive test, they were tested to as trianam, hemapenem, meropenem, and uh, erdapenem. And if they were negative, that's when they performed the challenge. They did a one one hundredth dose, one tenth each by a half hour or excuse me, sixty minute intervals, and then you know performed the full challenge procedure, which I thought was impressive and had to take a lot of time. So here are the results, and I've, again, found this very interesting. Of all the patients that reacted, a large majority of them, 237, reacted to amoxicillin. And, and most of those, as you can see here, were due to the augmentin component. I, I will note here that most of the patients had been seen at a reasonably quick interval. Two months was the average time from when they had the reaction to when they were tested, which is atypical from what we do. You're, we usually see patients, you know, I had a history five years ago, ten years ago, even if it was anaphylaxis, most of ours are coming up negative when we're doing the pre-pen testing. They do note that a majority of these patients had a history of anaphylaxis, and they attributed this to them being this tertiary center where they see a ton of different drug allergies. Urticaria was in 15%, and, and here are the surprising results. Only 30, I guess that's a good proportion, 15% of your pre-pens. That's certainly higher than what we see because we test everyone to penicillin or pre-pen. Um, 15% had these reactions. The minor determinants, it was higher at 20%. Amoxicillin, 85% of these patients had positive skin prick testing to amoxicillin, which is incredibly high. And I know there's this dichotomy between the U.S. patient population and the, um, the European. And specifically, most of this data seems to come out of Spain and uh, Italy, where, where this study was done. And they had an incredibly high rate of, of patients who were positive to amoxicillin, and, and theoretically that's due to the side chain associated with amoxicillin. Ampicillin was high as well, so is azosin. Hey Drew, what, what was your comment about it being the augmentin component? So clavulonic acid. So, so they're allergic to clavulonic acid? Theoretically. They, they didn't split it out. Um, they didn't test for clavulonic acid. They just tested for amoxicillin. So presumably everyone in this study was was sensitive to the amoxicillin side chain, if they were indeed sensitized. They didn't check to uh, clavulonic acid oh, specifically, okay. although theoretically you can. Oh, um, we don't specifically test for But that. they're testing them for the amoxicillin yes. side chain. Yes. Drew, yeah. do you know what percentage of these skin test positivities were IV versus? They, they all, most of them were IV down here. Yeah, because um, it's a much better strength than we test with. I'm just curious. So here's the ID. Well, for penicillin or ah, pen, yeah, one yeah. was uh, skin prick, and then 29 were ID. So the majority of all these were um, positive on ID testing. 
And the, and the interesting part is, uh, all, which is amazing, of the 212 patients that were positive, uh, 211 accepted challenges to all these different <laughs> medications, uh, Trianam, Imipenem, Meropenem, and Nertapenem, and none of them reacted, which is incredible. Here's another paper by Macy that I quickly pulled up, because they reference it in their discussion, and this is more of what we've been seeing in our clinic, where they looked at the last 500 patients they tested for pre-pen and pen-G, and then followed by amoxicillin challenge. And only four of the 500 had a positive skin test result. So obviously, there's some differences here. Four, this uh, is only, from the US. This is from the US. This is uh, from uh, San Diego in the LA area. Yes. Only four of them had a positive uh, amoxicillin challenge. And this is kind of what I've seen. You know, we, we just test to the uh, pre-pen and the pen-G, and then we, we challenge everyone with amoxicillin. I've had one patient in all the ones we've done that had the uh, hives after uh, the amoxicillin challenge, but overall everyone has done really well. So, you know, reacting to the side chain of, of amoxicillin and ampicillin is uh, it's either much lower or the positive predictive value of the tests they're using over there is not is not representative. What's the definition of penicillin allergy in this one? It's, it is a different patient population. That it, it's right. patients like a lot of people we see. Oh, I had a rash as a right. kid. It's the so acuity is much less. less. So, and, and in the other study, they found 30% of positive to pre-pan, or 15%, which is much higher than what we've been seeing. So I think because they're seeing a higher acuity, that can explain a lot of it. Because they're doing it sooner after, you know, they, they have these reactions, I think that can explain a lot of it too. But there are uh, really, really striking differences between uh, the two. They also say that 15 people during these challenges had uh, just subjective symptoms symptoms, and they were thought not to be positive on these challenges. So two very different observations. So why did they have such a high rate of uh, reactivity? Um, again, the reasons they state in, in this paper, because they're seeing these patients with high acuity, a majority with anaphylaxis, and they're, they're seeing them sooner than most of the time for, from what we see in, in our clinics. My take is I don't think all of these patients have I, true IgE immediate reactions to the uh, amoxicillin component. I didn't find any studies that looked over the positive predictive value of amoxicillin and ampicillin skin testing. You know, it'd be a hard study to do, I admit that, but to, to jump to the conclusion that all of these patients would, would react on amoxicillin uh, oral challenge. It, you know, I, I do think they are seeing sicker patients, but this is, again, a striking difference and more work needs to be done in this. But, I do think we get a lot of information in this study. Even these patients that were, we get called in the hospital saying, oh, it's a history of severe anaphylaxis with, with penicillin, we want to avoid carbapenems. Uh, there are recommendations, and, and we always agree with that. If you're really concerned, do a, a, uh, a challenge procedure, and we do that a fair amount, and I don't think we've ever had a reaction to carbapenem in a history, even the severe um, penicillin allergic patients. So I do think this study is helpful. This is the largest study to date that looked at uh, cross-reactivities of uh, carbapenems and astreonam. Again, a huge patient population. I thought it was a well-done study, other than the differences in the, uh, the positive skin prick testing results. And then all of these studies had negative skin test, or uh, skin test, yeah, same graded challenge. So up to date kind of summarizes their recommendations, and this is kind of what we've been doing. So um, if there's a severe history of anaphylaxis to penicillin, even if they do have a positive skin prick test to penicillin, we say just, just challenge them, and, uh, and we, we haven't had any reactions that I'm aware of. I don't know if you guys have seen any, but um, so that's kind of how we've been doing things, and I think that backs things up. But I know different areas are doing different testing. Again, we don't routinely include amoxicillin and, um, and ampicillin in our skin testing panel, but we do challenge everyone with amoxicillin before they leave. I don't know how people around the area are doing that, but um, uh, I think this kind of... Again, I, I I would do either the amoxicillin skin testing or do the uh, amoxicillin challenge just to rule this component out. But yeah, there seems to be two very different camps as, as far as the European and the U.S. data. Yeah, Drew, I have a tangentially related question. For a number of years, we didn't have the PPL reagent for skin testing. What we reverted to doing in our office was sending off IgE for PEN-G and PEN-V. But I actually who incidentally reviewed another article, which we may not get to, uh, that is on this subject, and they commented in there that those are unreliable tests. And I always thought they were unreliable when we 
we're falling back on them, but I don't know any data. I'm just wondering if anybody has any data on the usefulness of those tests compared to skin testing. They're, they're offered commercially. I saw a guy the other day whose history was weak. His skin test was positive to PEN-G. I didn't believe it, and I sent off the in vitro tests, and they were negative. So here I believe the in vitro test, even though theoretically it's less reliable than the skin test. And I was sort of in a, in a quandary as to what was the real outcome in this case. Frank, do you have any idea? I don't. I mean, I think it was just a hope that when free pen was gone, it would help, you know, the sensitivity to some extent. We were like you, we were running that initially, but since we had all these agents, we don't routinely do that anymore. And I think they're, you know, it, it is. Uh, to, and actually, they did review a small portion of this study saying it's much less sensitive. That depends on if you believe the, uh, um, the amoxicillin skin test results. Hey, Drew. So, I, so if I'm in the ICU and I have a patient who is hypotensive and we don't have time for all of this and they say they have a pen allergy, we normally are using s and It sounds like you're saying that we could probably give them a carbapen. You want to use a carbapen? Yeah, we would definitely. There's not a shortage of it. Like, yeah, right. Like, but but no, it, yeah, no, it, it, I would opt for the carbapenamin. Because, I mean, infectious disease colleagues and everything usually say Astrianam for that. So By the way, I don't know if you know, we have a program now where we yeah. get a consult every time an Astrianam order comes through. So we at least review the chart. Oh, we think the carbapenem would be um, something that would be better used, or a cephalosporin. Uh -huh. We usually get involved. Okay. I mean, if they're in the ICU, even if you give them anaphylaxis, you can manage it. <laughs> 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 Right, Drew, uh, can we move on, or do you have another paper? I have another. I okay, go ahead. Me. I'll try and quickly get through this. This is much quicker. So I have these patients who come in saying, you know, my eczema seems to worsen during the spring and summer months. I don't know if you guys have been seeing this, and I mainly see adults. So I know that data in adults is, is you know, there's not a ton of it out there, although it's a lot of people do believe this is a real phenomenon. And this goes back to 1918. Um, a doc named Walker presented four cases of eczema that seemed to be worse when he was around horses during the, the ragweed and pollen season, so I thought that this may be something that's rare. We are aeroallergens worsening atopic dermatitis. <clears throat> so they will go on to say there's great testing for you know, intranasal challenges, for rhinite, allergic rhinitis and things like that, but the ways to challenge to see if aeroallergens worsen eczema have, have been lacking. Um, I've seen HP patch testing using these patients, but again, you don't know the concentration on the skin that we're giving, so we'll, whether those real results or not, uh, who knows. So this is the first study, and I thought it was an interesting study. It's very small, but uh, they used an environmental challenge chamber to evaluate atopic dermatitis patients with a known sensitization to grass pollen and uh, challenged them for a couple days to see if their eczema worsened, and it was a double blind, or it was a uh, monocenter randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, so uh, a great one using dactylus, uh, Glomerata, which is a, evidently a pertinent grass in Europe. And uh, the challenge procedures <laughs> were, were long. They consisted of four hours on two consecutive days with 4,000 pollen grains per, uh, per meter, which is thought to be what a, a typical heavy pollen day is during the spring and summer months. They also, and this is important, too. They also wore a non a standard non-irritating uniform. It was covered the majority of their body, other than their chest, their neck, um, their arms up to their elbows, um, and, and they wanted to see whether the direct areas of contact were worsened by um, this, this pollen exposure. So at each visit, the uh, severity of atopic dermatitis was rated by a dermatologist. Again, they were blinded, so um, they looked at the severity, the extent of skin involvement. They also looked at some subjective items, including itch and sleeplessness. Evidently, that's a standard scoring. I haven't been using it, but um, it's online. You can go plug in a few variables and calculate their score as scores. They also looked at exposed versus non-exposed uh, areas, which I thought was really interesting. And the primary endpoint was the change in the score as score between the pre-challenge and post-challenge day three. Again, it's a small study. Evidently, everyone wants to get into this environmental challenge chamber, so they had limited time to do it, and they obviously couldn't do it during the pollen season. So they tried to do this in one year, and they had a large number of dropouts. So in each group, they assessed 17 patients. Um, 
11 were excluded in the um, treatment group, but most of that, they say, is due to the fact that they just couldn't get them in two days in a row and have them come up for the follow-up visits um, when they had this chamber available. There were uh, more people in the um, placebo group, so 11 versus 6. One of the patients in the uh, challenge group actually withdrew after the first day because his um, eczema had flared so severely. 11 in the placebo. There are no differences in baseline characteristics, height, weight, um, severity of atopic dermatitis by that score, at score of baseline, or serum total IgE or specific IgE emerge. As you can see, here's day one. The score, at score here on the left. Pre-challenge day one, two, three, and four. And as you can see, they, they do significantly go up in the Verum group, which is the uh, treatment group in this. And, and it goes out at least five days in these patients. So a significant worsening. They also looked at local areas, and that's down here. Here is the exposed areas in the treatment group. Here is the unexposed areas in the treatment group. So the exposed areas go up significantly over those few days whereas the non-exposed areas do not go up uh, significantly. So, you know, when people do have worsening uh, of their eczema in this study when they are exposed, it's just in those areas that are not exposed by, by clothing. Again, non-air exposed, there, there was not a significant difference between, and in the placebo groups, there was no significant difference in, in the uh, SCORAD uh, throughout the study. And here's representative, here's before the challenge, here's afterwards, here's before, here's after, and again, if you notice, it's just these exposed areas where their eczema seems to be worsening. So, it's the first double-blind um, study looking at the exposure of grass and pollen-sensitized. Again, these have to be pollen-sensitized with atopic dermatitis. And again, they tried to use a, a representative of a, a similar pollen count on a pollen-rich day. So, tried to create a real-life situation. And again, it was only during the, in the air-exposed areas. Um, they go on to say... Clearly, we want more patients in this study, but it was difficult to get done. But even beyond that, uh, even with a small sample size, they were able to uh, pick up a significant difference. So there, there certainly seems to be something to this. And as far as real-world stuff, I, I, you know, I, I think it does play into our practice. If someone notes that they seem to get worse during the spring and summer, you can document that they're sensitive to things like grasses, birch, things like that. Having them wear something that covers those areas during that time may help with their, uh, with their eczema specifically in the areas where they're pollen exposed. So I thought this was a short, uh, small, but uh, very interesting study. Now, one comment I would make is that's, that uh, chamber is about 20 times a high grass day here. Really? And it's 200 per meter squared. Is per it? Meter, yeah. Meter cube, yeah. Maybe it doesn't, I mean, that's more like maybe three, three change, levels. When they're, if they're traveling to Europe. Yeah, but it makes sense they might want to even do it higher just to accentuate the difference. Yeah, no, if they had a bigger study, it'd be, it would be interesting to see those lower pollen counts on a, on a larger patient population. But no, I thought this was interesting. Well, it sounds like they're sort of postulating it's like skin testing yourself. Right. Basically, mm -hmm. since it didn't affect non uh, Did they comment about uh, rhinitis symptoms while they were doing that? They commented about asthma symptoms, and a few of the asthmatics did have a uh, I wonder how blind it uh, that is yes. true, but the, the dermatologists are, are looking at them on, on different days, and they don't know about their asthma symptoms or anything like that. The patients will know when they're doing oh, Yeah, no, for sure. But And they, they did use subjective versus objective, and what they looked at there mainly was the objective symptoms, you know, the, the SCORAD system. So, yeah, the patients probably knew. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is uh, Sydney Long. I'm one of the second-year allergy neurology fellows. Today I'll be talking about an article that just came out in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology this month. Um, it, I think it was published online in June, but um, it was printed um, this month. And it's about the uh, association between vitamin D levels and allergy-related outcomes, um, looking at races, uh, different races and other factors. Um, the allergy-related outcomes are specifically um, eczema, um, uh, allergic rhinitis, food allergy and asthma. So a brief introduction. Um, there's been increased interest in vitamin D uh, role in allergic um, diseases. Um, as, as you all know, vitamin D supplementation is affordable, non-invasive, and easily administered. So if there is a 
correlation or association with um, uh, allergic diseases, it would be very helpful to be able to uh, implement. It would be very easy to be able to implement this. Um, however, a lot of the studies that have looked at whether vitamin D, you know, um, positively or negatively affects the incidence of allergic uh, allergy-related outcomes has been mixed, and um, the authors gave several different reasons, and uh, one of those was that the, um, those studies have often used um, kind of self-reported uh, questionnaires based reporting on fruit frequency instead of actually measuring the vitamin D levels, and as you know, that's very, um, that's widely variable and does not take into account the vitamin D that is produced by uh, sun exposure, the supplement intake. Um, so there's been proposed mechanisms of how vitamin D can affect um, allergic diseases, um, including how it directly and indirectly affects the immune system. There's been previous studies suggesting that it's a strong modifier um, between intestinal flora and inflammatory disorders. And going from there, um, studies have shown that low levels of vitamin D um, can be a risk factor for inflammatory bowel disease, um, suggesting that vitamin D can affect gut inflammation. So uh, taking from that, um, gut inflammation um, affecting immune development and function, translating that into how it can affect, affect um, inflammatory diseases in uh, allergy immunology, specifically the eczema and um, allergy. So the objectives of this study uh, was uh, several fold. First was to assess whether vitamin D levels that were collected at several time, uh, different time points, either during pregnancy, uh, at delivery, or at the time of clinical evaluation at two years of age, were related to incidences of eczema, um, incidences of um, ATP as measured by um, serum IgE levels and uh, skin prick tests as well as uh, incidences of asthma as measured by a parental report of a doctor's diagnosis of asthma uh, between the ages of three to nine. Um, the second objective was to assess whether there are any associations between um, um, African American and Caucasian um, children. And then lastly, they tried to look at uh, whether the vitamin D levels measured at different time points prenatally at, with cord blood and at the time of clinical evaluation, um, whether they correlated with each other. There, um, I'll go over that in a little bit. So the study population, um, they used the um, Wayne County Health Environment Allergy and Asthma Longitudinal Study Population. Um, this is an NIH-funded cohort study that enrolled pregnant women and their children um, in the Detroit area. They followed these children through early childhoods um, to examine their early life exposures and kind of related to development of childhood asthma and allergies. Um, I think the study started in, uh, they started recruiting patients between, uh, in 2003 and um, ended in 2007, and they're still following these children um, today. The children in the study had to have information on at least one of the outcomes at two years of age that I uh, noted earlier, um, or have participated in a health interview um, between the ages of three and six, and that was to assess for the uh, diagnosis of asthma. Um, they only looked at children who were uh, um, African American or and and Caucasian, um, non-Hispanic, non-Middle Eastern, to kind of be because those were the highest. Um, so that they would be able to make um, stronger um, associations. Was there an original rationale to separate whites and blacks? And what was the thought there? To see whether, um, because of the vitamin D levels difference between um, African American and Asian children, to see if that played a role independent of um, their vitamin D. So this is the kind of uh, enrollment detail. So there were uh, greater than 1,200 um, children who were enrolled in the longitudinal study. These were ex excluded um, prior to the two-year visit for 
for the, the list of reasons. Um, of those that were eligible for a year two visit, um, the group on the left were excluded from the study because they either didn't have any vitamin D level measured or were missing um, the, the data from their year two visit and did not have a, uh, weren't able to complete a questionnaire for whatever reason. Um, so ultimately they looked at this, uh, this group of uh, children um, and they divided into the, the, the different um, races and decided to look at um, black and white uh, uh, children here for a combined uh, number of 707 um, study subjects here. So um, they conducted parental interviews about the health of their children, breastfeeding, and exposure to animals. And these were for kind of subset studies that didn't have um, significant, they didn't have enough, I think, number of people to make strong um, conclusions from. Um, and then the, they also conducted parental interviews, like I said, about whether a child um, received a diagnosis of asthma between the ages of three and six. They uh, underwent a clinic visit age two with a physician tra uh, trained in the study protocol, where uh, they underwent a, an exam for eczema skin prep testing for um, the listed allergens there um, included um, seasonal and perennial allergens as well as food allergens. Um, and then they had serum Ig levels measured. Um, one should stress that they didn't have all of these done for every child. Um, the, to qualify for the study, the child just had to have at least one of these completed or um, or Call up, you know, had the parental interview about the um, asthma diagnosis. Um, they measured vitamin D level, uh, calculated as the sum of D2 and D3. They adjusted it for seasonal variation. We called it the de-seasonalized uh, vitamin D level, um, based on the mathematical formula that uh, used the month of collection, because vitamin D levels can vary based on uh, sun exposure, et cetera. They measured levels either from stored samples from pregnancy, which count as the prenatal level um, at, the at the time of delivery, which is from the cord blood, and then at age uh, two years of age from the clinic visit. They did statis statistical analysis to calculate the odd, um, odds ratio for the um, level of vitamin D um, and compared it to the the four kind of analytical outcomes that we talked about, they did it for the entire uh, group of children they looked at as well as separately for um, black and white children. And then, like I mentioned, the subgroup analyses were completed as well, but the, because of their small sample sizes, um, they didn't have any strong conclusions from them. So this is um, just uh, one of the tables that looked at the group of women who um, were included in the analysis versus those that were excluded. Essentially the ones from the left side of the um, table, the figure I showed earlier compared to the one on the right. Um, they included a lot more than they excluded. Um, and then th th there were no uh, differences between the two except for, except between the two groups except for um, that mother um, had a indoor dog during and I don't really know whether that, I don't think this is really all that important because they uh, didn't list all the reasons why they were excluded in the first place. So I don't know um, like how this would, would play a role in them being excluded, but that was what they um, found to be statistically significant. Um, here is a uh, table that shows their average vitamin D level at each time point. Um, looking at all children, you can see that the prenatal uh, level kind of correlated to the two-year level, uh, more so than the court, um, the court blood. And then also um, uh, significant is the, uh, the fact that is the fact that the white children tend to have higher vitamin D levels at all of the time points um, compared to black children, and they were all um, statistically significant. Um, here are the rates of the outcomes for uh, 
those children um, be just some um, statistics to point out more than half of um, black children and more than a third of uh, the white children were atopic um, and then yeah and then some um, interesting um, numbers to point out the number of black children uh, the percentage of black children with ex diagnosed eczema was almost uh, was greater than twofold um, the, that of white children. And then you can also see that the diagnosis <coughs> of asthma was higher in the uh, group of black children compared to white children. And then kind of here is where the money is. Um, this, is this table shows the association between the vitamin D levels and the outcomes um, that they were looking for. And um, they presented these and I'll, I'll go over them um, more closely so you can see better. But it's um, but the so you, this is for all the the all the entire group of children. This is for white children only. This is for uh, black children only. The bolded um, points are the ones that are were statistically significant. Um, so we will go. Oops. So looking at all the children. You can see that if they looked at the prenatal measurement of um, vitamin D, um, an increase in that level was associated with a decreased um, risk of eczema overall. Right here. And then um, if you looked at the cord blood level measurements of um, vitamin D, you can see that it is inversely associated with um, a positive skin prick response and then as well as um, positive aryl allergen serum IgE. Um, everything else was not statistically significant. Looking at the population of uh, white children only, um, you see that it matches the, the a group of all, all the children based on the cord blood level of vitamin D, um, where this is a positive skin prick testing to at least one of the um, allergens tested, and this is positive um, Ig, uh, at least one positive serum IgE levels to arrow allergens. Um, they mentioned that the association of the prenatal um, vitamin D level, which initially, which pe previously you saw had, you know, was statistically significant for all the children, were not in the white children, but were higher, were more strongly associated. Um, in white children than in black children. So 0.79 compared to 0.96. And then, um, and lastly, in the black children po um, population, you see um, at the time of visit, higher, 25, uh, higher vitamin D levels, um, at the time of the two-year visit, was associated with the decreased odds of the serum IgE um, uh, positivity to one of the allergens. So I just wanted to kind of highlight the um, different points that I just went through. So ultimately, um, this study showed that vitamin D levels were associated with some allergy-related outcomes. Um, and the pattern that they saw, although you know not all, all the um, points that they looked at were significant, generally indicated that children with higher vitamin D levels to have fewer allergy-related outcomes. And this is um, just a summary of what I mentioned earlier based on, about the results. Um, so ultimately, this study was helpful in showing that, um, that while vitamin D can't be, you know, this study didn't show that it, it, it vitamin D, uh, associated with disease causation, but ultimately there were no um, increased risk with um, increased vitamin D levels in any of the, the points that they looked at. This will, um, they mentioned that vitamin D um, might be a proxy for UV exposure, which can affect re, um, the reduction in their propensity for inflammation, which might explain the, um, the, the decreased risk of eczema in patients. 
And if that were the case, they just wanted to know that supplementation might not overcome the effects of the deficiency. Why did, why did they make that last statement? I mean, basically the take-home message here is vitamin D is good, and the higher the level, the better as far as not having allergy outcomes. So why does it matter whether you get it from UV or you take it as a supplement? Well, they counted both. They were just trying to explain the mechanism between um, for the association with low risk of eczema. And they noted that if this were the case, just because they used a calculated sum of um, D3 and D2, um, that just having supplementation might not be a might not give you the, the outcome of kind of increased. Uh, so you're speculating with this. Yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, this study is really conflicted by the fact that the um, if you look at the population over all the vitamin D levels are associated with all these allergy and outcomes, but then if you look within the different races, there's not a very strong effect. And so basically, it says that African or black um, people have lower vitamin D and they also have worse allergy outcomes. And it seems like that's actually the driver of the association, not the, um, because once you separate them, if it was really vitamin D, you'd see that within each of the populations, but you only see it. So you can't really say that it's not being black. That's the reason that you have um, this association. Um, it's because it's, it's completely compounded by the, you know, that the vitamin D levels are lower in, in black individuals. That's, do you follow that? Or? So in other words, the, the conclusion that more vitamin D is good doesn't it's hold very strongly. It's very strongly confounded by the fact that there could be another factor of race that's driving the... Yeah, that this, this is just a correlation. It doesn't mean right. A causes B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Have they looked at these studies on the equator where there's more sunlight? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> Scott... I wonder if that was reliable. Right, I mean, Scott Weiss has done all this stuff where he's pretty convinced that, you know, Vitamin D levels are very strongly associated with the asthma epidemic. That you know, if you live in areas where you have lower vitamin D levels, there's uh, increased you know, asthma prevalence. But um, not all studies have shown that, and yeah. a lot of studies are like this that are kind of confounded by that. So. He's the guy who goes back to thinking it all started when we stopped giving kids cod liver oil. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah, which right, is very just... high vitamin. In their <clears throat> hypothesis, they were talking about vitamin D affecting the microbiome. So th this same group, they they had about five abstracts at the academy on uh, the baby, you know, acquisition of the microbiome. The same study set. Did they talk about that in their discussion? Are they going to correlate these levels with what they found in the gut flora? Uh, Isn't that no, what your I paper is on, Bill? Um, no, a different one. Well, not your fault, but this remains confusing. Yeah, yeah it's not to say that yeah. the vitamin D thing, and also the you know the ongoing well, some small trials and then the ongoing trials for vitamin D supplementation. It's not been all that clear that you really affect the asthma yeah. outcomes with that. Except for osteoporosis. <laughs> and obviously, the study they use kind of parental interview about diagnosis of children uh, their kids with asthma because that was also one of the reasons. It's actually quite striking looking at the other studies that they've done on vitamin D and allergic uh, outcomes. They're very conflicting data. Um, I thought that this kind of highlighted one of, you know, the, 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 um, the numbers were good. So, interesting point. We had a speaker perhaps last year who basically said that we didn't think there was a direct effect on vitamin D on asthma or atopic disease, but it, uh, on reducing infection as a driver of development of asthma, that it was essentially a, uh, an anti-infectious agent and pro-inflammatory. Um, I don't know, Teal, you have a comment on that? Mm. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I, I think Ray Panateri in Penn is a big believer in that. Uh, I know he's been suggesting, and others, 50,000 units of supplemental vitamin D a month. Yeah, I've, I've always, you know, clinically it's hard to know what to do. I mean, I, I typically do try to, you know, if, if I think people are have low vitamin D levels, I try to remedy that. And not, I'm not entirely sure that that's a, a big thing. And I have a, I have a, 
one really severe asthmatic who I really have a lot of trouble even getting her vitamin D levels up into the normal range and do that high dose 50,000. The question is even what is the normal range? I think many have settled on over 30. Yeah. Um, so it's a very confusing topic. I'm over 40. Didn't we have Ash come and talk to us? And she said she, and she's an expert on vitamin D metabolism and all this. She, she says she doesn't get, she doesn't get people over 800 a day. It depends if you're talking about bone health or what we yeah. think are other values of vitamin D. All of this. Yeah, but there's very little data to support that vitamin D supplementation improves any disease other than osteoporosis. So mm -hmm. far, unless you're in Boston. <laughs> yeah, that's you know almost all the studies like looking at asthma and. and heart disease and all these diseases that are associated with low vitamin D levels, therapeutic treatment doesn't do any good. So there's something more to it than just vitamin D levels. There's, there's got to be something else going because you imp imp improve their levels, they don't get better. You could argue the disease is progressed already. You need to do it from it's an infant. infancy. But well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Even in that study, the kids' levels of vitamin D weren't very different. It was really the maternal vitamin D. Kids themselves were getting adequate sun exposure <laughs> or something, right? So it was kids. the adults that, well, the, the kids that, was, Sydney, wasn't that right? The, the kids, the, their own levels, even though they were statistically different, were really pretty close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, Bill, you've got a presentation to add? We only saved you seven or eight minutes. <laughs> 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 but you're only the chief of the department. <laughs> Jason, where's the, uh, the advance? Just to get on the when you see the Mac. Excuse um, me, can you make that full screen? Yeah. 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 Lynn's uh, started so many um, presentations of exotic travel he's done, so I just go back to India. In the spirit of things, I just wanted to show you uh, a uh, camel fair I went to at the Thar Desert. It's the, um, been going on for several thousand years, the nomadic traders of uh, camels and horses. It's the, uh, not the size of the Mojave Desert, it straddles the uh, western part of India and uh, Pakistan. And trading horses and uh, the women of the villages do the wall painting, it's very colorful and uh, just a very exotic uh, part of the world that we uh, aren't so typically experienced. Uh, the whole part of India was a very colorful experience. So, um, since I had a touch of deli belly there, and my microbiome is probably more of the Indian subconscious. Continent right now, this uh, article that's impressed, and Jackie was of interest. Uh, it's one of the first looks where they um, try to analyze the flora of the airways in asthmatics versus uh, non asthmatics. So, the, what they did it was a retrospective um, study where they took um, samples from this University of Chicago. They looked at uh, 39 patients with a variety of asthma and uh, 19 control subjects. And then they um, <clears throat> had bronchial washings, which they considered their endobronchial samples, and then they compared to EAL, which they considered their peripheral airway. So they had in both sets. The, um, just from their data set, they were pretty well matched. Uh, the asthmatics had lower FEV1s, as you would expect and um, higher concentrations of exhaled nitric oxide and a larger percent of uh, EAL, eosinophils. So that was it, uh, the study population. So then they um, looked at what was the flora in the um, airways. So this first one, um, looking at the phyla level, it's very, it shows you how daunting these studies are. Um, they had, you know, like, you can say 50 patients and maybe seven 
hundred samples, but came up to over a million data points from all the um, microbes that they came up with. And uh, the data were actually analyzed at the Argonne National Laboratory there in Chicago. The, so, but what was uh, interesting was that even though the, the lung biomass, it turns out, is a whole lot less than the skin or the gut. So it's maybe a hundred to a thousand fold less number of uh, microorganisms in our airways. Um, and they found that um, six of them actually accounted for, six phyla accounted for almost 90% of all the airway bacteria um, seen there in panel A. And um, if you go to the general genre level, then the top 25 of the 300 that they identify accounted for about two thirds of that. So it's a more manageable total actually than what you see in some of these gut microbiome studies. Um, and you know, there's no way to go through all this data in detail this morning, but what they found, they then compared the central airways, these EB endobronchial samples compared to the BAL samples that they said were the BAL more synonymous with the peripheral airways. And the take home point here was that um, there was more diversity in the central airway samples from the, both the asthmatic and the control subjects. So for the bulk of their data analysis, they went to their endobronchial washes for the, looking at most of their data changes with corticosteroids. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of these different um, analyses in the paper. They had like 20 different figures looking at all the different uh, microflora that were seen in the different compartments. The take home here was that if you're looking at the uh, endobronchial versus the BAL samples from the asthmatic population, that um, there were some differences in, in the flora between lactobacillus and cinnamonis were less abundant and other ones, including streptococcal species, were more abundant in the endobronchial samples um, from the asthmatics compared to the BAL. So they found this more greater changes for whatever reasons in the um, central airways. Well, uh, just a very basic question. I used to think, I, I used to think a long time ago, the lungs were pretty sterile places and we didn't have all these bacteria. Is there a point? In which the lung is sterile, or how far down do you have bacteria they, in your in airway? In the um, intro, they said that in the fetal development it's um, sterile, but quickly after birth, it uh, rapid acquisition of this microflora. And is that true all the way down to alveoli, or I don't know if they've done. It, presumably, yes. Um, you would think though that the central again at first, in much greater concentrations. So these studies in adults show that there's less diversity in the um, more peripheral airways. So, you know, probably as our lung defense is innate uh, immune in the airways, there's some um, protection there. But um, the whole whole airways are colonized. Yeah, that's why people with you know ciliary dysfunction or bronchiectasis always get infection unless you do something to improve airway clearance because there's always bacteria in the airways, and so if you don't clear it. So I guess that's our simplistic pulmonary way of thinking about that. So. The, <clears throat> the right hand panel of that, that panel D, is just showing that in the control subjects that there's a similar pattern um, that's observed. Um, they didn't get too much more detail there. Just to get to a more interesting part here is when they started adding corticosteroids. Um, they then, we go here to the very end, they stratified the um, subjects according to their corticosteroid use. Um, so you can see their airway prediction there at the top, greater than 80%. Very few of those had courses of oral corticosteroids um, versus the two other panels, 60 to 80%. 60% group. Um, and they found that no subjects um, that used the um, oral corticosteroids hadn't also been on 
inhaled corticosteroids. So the bulk of their um, analysis was just that they made a conclusion that, um, if we go back to the previous slide, um, they found some changes in the flora based on corticosteroid history. Um, the major take-home point was that Pseudomonas species went up in the um, airway samples in the patients that had been treated with oral um, corticosteroids. So that's of interest. And there's a lot of heavy-duty biostatistics that came about this article. So I had actually read another one. Teal could help us with the talking about alpha and beta diversity of these samples. These are actually terms that came from, I think, anthropology initially, looking at human populations. But anyway, these alpha diversity is looking at the diversity of microorganisms in this particular population. Um, and you want to have a diverse gut flora, let's say. So if your alpha diversity goes down, that's a bad thing generally. And that's what the corticosteroids um, tend to do there was a marked um, decrease in the diversity of the flora with an increase in population of the Pseudomonas um, group. And the other way of looking at these population studies is you compare samples of like the controls versus the asthmatics, that's called beta diversity. And they showed that there was significantly greater beta diversity after corticosteroid use. So showing more skewing of the population by the intervention with either the increase in asthma severity or the treatment. So um, these are some of the more complicated studies in this paper that go through that, showing that the oral corticosteroid significant influence on the proportions of pseudomonas. And it turns out that when they did some other analyses that the relationship was that um, the patients that had the highest exhaled nitric oxide, the highest PAL fluid eosinophils, had um, a significant increase in both rickettsia and pseudomonas in the endobronchial samples. So to conclude, um, key points, the microbiome of the central airways in asthmatic patients has a lower diversity and a greater abundance of key bacterial pathogens controls. So <clears throat> intervention with the steroids decreases diversity um, of the microbiome there. And um, these changes correlate with um, corticosteroid use and we're seeing airflow obstruction is measured by FEV1. And also that the central airways based on these uh, endobronchial samples is substantially different than that of the peripheral airways. Um, It's uh, pretty much one of the first studies that looked at this in the airways in the microbiome. Um, they acknowledge it's a small study. It's, it was retrospective, so they couldn't get uh, oral cultures at the same time, which you would want. It's kind of a prospective study looking at this acquisition. But a first step in a very complicated um, and expensive study that was how do they reconcile the fact that you do so much better on inhaled steroids or control of asthma and all these findings? Um, you know, it's not the kind of study we can answer that <laughs> question. That's the question, what are we to do? <laughs> yeah, we got to treat them because they got to breathe. Just that, uh, doing that change with, their flora, though. With the intervention, you are altering your flora. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a consequence. So maybe there could be some other intervention that would well, here's the good news. Teal is the speaker next week, and I'm sure he'll have an answer to this question. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, mast cell and asthma, uh, but he'll remember the unanswered questions from today. <laughs> I think I'm mostly going to talk about our, our own studies on mast cells and asthma. <laughs> Just teasing. You. See you later. All right. It makes Thank sense you. to treat them with antibiotics. Sorry, go ahead, Based on these results, we think it makes sense to treat them with antibiotics. If you're asthmatic patient, put them on rounds of antibiotics similar to CF patient. Yeah, that's the other limitation study. They couldn't control yeah. for prior antibiotic use in the patient's bed and the other kind of thing.
of things. That's yeah. a good point. They're often coincident with steroids. We empirically give people antibiotics whether they need them or not. If right. they've been sick long enough, so you don't know that the steroids made the change, or maybe they didn't track antibiotic use. It's not. Bottom line is that more <laughs> 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 Well, did you well, I wondered why a lot of these are. I wonder why a lot of people do these uh, studies. I think that's a big thing. I think you're busy. 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 I think you